Welcome to lesson number three on the Blood Moons, and I'm Bob O'Dell with Root Source. This is my partner, Gadone, in Root Source, and he's the visionary behind this amazing new venture that uh, is underway. Last lesson, we talked about the origins of who discovered the Blood Moons and so forth, and looking at that. Well, now we're going to look at the origins of a solar eclipse. So let's go back to. 1492, and let's talk about a little bit of history there. Uh, Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand signed off on the Alhambra Decree on March 31st of 1492. And in that decree, they said the Jews must leave. The expulsion of the Jews. Very sad day. As they issued that decree, they originally thought they could get this done in three months, but it ended up taking longer and there was an extension. And they gave the Jews till August 1st. So that was the last day. They had to be out by August 1st. And then on August 2nd was the 9th of Av, the traditional day of mourning for the Jews in which they lost the temple. And it's certainly significant that there's so many things that uh, difficult things that have happened to the Jewish people in the ninth of Av. So that is uh, historical and accurate. And then on August 3rd, Christopher Columbus begins sailing to what he thinks is the Far East, but ends up that he discovers the New World, North and South America. Well, the blood moons in that time period don't occur in 1492. They occur in starting in 1493 and 1494. So Christopher Columbus departs in August 3rd and they come back in 1493. They come back before the first of the blood moons in even happens. So they've already gone and come back and the news is going out that the uh, that new world has been been discovered. So the critical question here is, are the blood moons significant if they're not accurately placed into 1492? And so there's been a lot of discussion about that. But here's the surprise. We need to look at a solar eclipse that happened in April on April 26th during the Alhambra decree while the Jews were getting this horrible news and uh, preparing to, to leave Spain. So remember that solar eclipse that hits the North Pole in 2015? If we were to call that solar eclipse Generation 30, then Generation 1 would be that solar eclipse in 1492, the one I was just showing to you. You see, solar eclipses can be related to each other. There is a thing called a Seros, which is a, a family of eclipses that appear 18 years apart. So we have a case here where this is one in 1901, and 18 years and 10 days later, you have another one that has a very similar shape. It's just shifted on the planet and, and, uh, and shifted a little bit north of the previous eclipse. And then the next one is shifted again, and it's shifted north. And, and they continue to move north on the Earth as the uh, Saros continues until eventually they sort of fall off the North Pole, which is what we're seeing on these, uh, this uh, solar eclipse on March 20th. It's getting, there's only one more eclipse in that series that will be total and then it, it will uh, have, uh, it will start missing the Earth completely. So we have, so these solar eclipses are related and what we're saying here is that you go back 30 generations for this eclipse and you hit this eclipse in 1492. So what happened on that eclipse in 1492? Where did it fall on the earth? What's the path? What's the path of totality on that particular eclipse all the way back in 1492? Look at this. 
right between North America and South America? Let's take a closer look here. Uh, it goes right through Panama and right right does it touch the yes it touches panama right there let's let's move in further and there it is now the panama canal actually comes right through here and so it's really right at the exit if you will of the panama canal into the atlantic ocean this is atlantic this is pacific wow arguments so i'm going to propose a meaning and then i'm going to try to speak against that proposal. Here's a meaning. God knew before the beginning of time that Spain would expel the Jews in that period. And he wanted to make a statement that said, yeah, 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 you've got free will. You do that, and I'll do this. I will open up the new world, and I will provide a place in the years to come for Jews to be safe. They will come to South America first, and then to North America later as it develops. I promised a second surprise. So the second surprise is the origins of a lunar eclipse. Which lunar eclipse? Well, how about the lunar eclipse that's coming up shortly, the one on April 3rd of this year? Let's go back to 1492 again and find something else. You see, during this critical period of 1492 between the Alhambra decree and the date that the Jews had to leave, there was a lunar eclipse in that period as well. And if the, most, if the coming lunar eclipse is considered to be generation 30, then the lunar eclipse that we were just looking at in May of 1492 would be generation 1. Well, that sounds familiar. You see, the solar eclipse was the same way. What happens is these two events are linked like siblings. They appear about two weeks apart every 18 years for the last 30 successive generations. That's just science. It's not random. It has to be that way. You see, whenever you have a lunar eclipse like this, then either two weeks before or two weeks after, you have to have some kind of solar eclipse. And similarly, take any solar eclipse and look two weeks before or after, and you have to have some kind of lunar eclipse. So these events, being two weeks apart, are linked, just like the events in 1492 are also about two weeks apart. So what does this lunar eclipse look like if we go back 30 generations? Well, here's the diagram. So the first thing to notice about this diagram is the white and the dark. Now, the white and dark is not day and night. It's see it, can't see it, okay? So you see here that North America and South America could potentially see this if it wasn't cloudy. It means the Indians would see it back in 1492. But we need to take a closer look up here. What is this diagram? Well, right here, we have the dark part of the shadow called the umbra. And here, we have a lighter part of the Earth's shadow called the penumbra. And let's put the moon down in this red circle and see what it looks like. Ah, so there, if the moon is fully contained within this red circle, which we call the umbra, then the moon can turn red. But if the moon is halfway in between, partly in this area and partly not, then it's a partial eclipse. You see, down here we have the umbra, which doesn't look red anymore because the moon is, isn't fully in it. And so uh, we have the umbra here, and we have the penumbra up here. Now you notice that the P 
pin number, you can't really even see anything going on up here, can you? But down here, it looks a little bit darker. What you see here is the moon is just barely entering into the penumbra part of the shadow. So a very small portion of the moon would be a little bit darker, a few percentage points darker. Would it be noticed? No, it really wouldn't be noticed. So why are we making a big deal of it? How could an event that's not noticed on Earth be considered significant? Hmm. Well, before we answer that question, I'd like to ask another question because I said before, I would try not to conceal anything from you that would make you feel more positive about my arguments. So let me tell you something just a little bit negative about the last eclipse we were showing you. I didn't tell you that it was an annular eclipse. Now it was a, it was a solar eclipse, but it's, it's an annular eclipse, which looks like this. It doesn't have the beautiful corona around. Now an annular eclipse is very rare, but not quite as rare as a total solar eclipse. So we could ask ourselves, hmm, wouldn't a total solar eclipse be more significant if God was going to make a statement? Well, the answer to both these questions, I think, is in this chart as to why these events are unique enough for me to start talking about them. So this chart shows 30 generations of eclipses, of solar eclipses here. And this is the one that's, uh, that's just coming up. And we go back 30 generations and we see the uh, solar and lunar eclipse in 1492. Now look down here. This solar eclipse has been running for a while. It's Saros started hundreds of years before 1492, and it's been running in a series of annular eclipses. You see, it runs uh, over 20 of them, and this is the last annular eclipse of the series. Hmm. And then it turns total, and it stays total all the way. But on the lunar eclipse, this is the very first eclipse in the Saros. We have a brand new baby here. This is like uh, this is like the patriarch of the new Saros line on this particular eclipse. So this is the very first one you can have. So when you look at them together and say this is the last annular in the series and this is the first one of all, and you move up and go 30 generations, and then look what happens. This is the first time that the solar and the lunar are both total. So it's almost like we have a beginning of something that's going to take a long time. And now we have a fulfillment of something. Now that's the way you could look at it and say, these things as taken together are significant. So while this series looks significant and unique, it was not possible to notice this at that time. It took the age of computers to go back and see the pattern. Do you think God might do something like that? Well, that's what you have to decide in this course. Now, there's another thing about this eclipse. So what does this line mean and what does this dot mean? Well, this dot is the location on Earth where if you went out in the exact middle of the eclipse, the moon would be directly over you. And as long as you're on this line, then the moon would be exactly north or south of you. It wouldn't be to the east or to the west. It would just be north or south. So when we look at that center line and plot it over here, look at what we see. Look how close it is to this star, which represents the geographic center of the United States. In other words, its center line. So it's almost like, again, this was meant to be noticed later. Now, I've got another piece of this surprise, and that is this star, the, first, the top star here, is the geographical center of the continental United States. We talked about that in the first lesson. This star here is where Mark Biltz grew up. How about that? <laughs> oh, 
you know, he pastors a church in Tacoma, Washington, but he moved there. This is where he grew up. Oh, let's add a star for John Hagee. John Hagee lives in uh, San Antonio, also pretty close to this center line. So when I was speaking about the center line of the geographic center of the United States in the first lesson, it wasn't without reason that I did it. And I'll say something else. We're not done with the center line of the United States. Well, I'd like to make one more connection to this story by saying one more thing about Mark Biltz, who grew up here. Remember, we were talking about these eclipses that are related to each other, and they're 18 years apart. Have you heard that before? Do you remember in the second lesson when we looked at Mark and his life? He had lots of time passing. There were struggles and testing in his life, and it lasted for 18 years. Now, I wonder if Mark has made that connection himself. Mark is somewhat of an astronomer, so he knows about the Cerro series. He even writes about it in his book. So the 18-year period is not lost on him. I wonder. Now, I don't know for sure if God is giving us a clue about Mark's life using this 18 years, but I do know this. 18 years does appear in Scripture. Remember Jesus and the woman who was bent over? And she said, he said, Satan has bound her for these 18 long years, and then she was released. So there is a scriptural basis for an 18-year period of being in some kind of holding pattern. So we have that direct from Scripture. Now, is God throwing in? But here is something that is so obvious that we don't even have to think about it. Whether or not this path meant something from God, we can say this, that God is worthy of praise. And Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, that I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and all my pleasure I will do. We can't be 100% certain that that solar eclipse means something, but we can be 100% certain that this verse from Scripture is real and it is alive and that whatever God says that he will do, when he says my counsel shall stand and all my pleasure I will do, we can take that to the bank. This is for sure. There is no question that he had his eye on his Jewish people. And there was no question that when they were being expelled from Spain, he cared. And there is no question that he knew he was going to make a way for them to have a place in South and North America. And he knew that the United States would ultimately be the place where the most number of Jews were living in the entire world. After they were decimated in World War II, yes, the United States held more Jews than any other place. Israel has now passed that, but, but it was the United States. He knew that he was going to make that happen and allow that, and he did. And for that, we can certainly praise him. So let's continue. And I think we've reached the point in this course where we can start to look at the big picture of the blood moons and ask ourselves, are they speaking specifically or only generally? Check out Root Source, and we'll see you next time.